this house. You understand? So at that moment, I opened cheek and I drank the bottle of cheek, almost like entire bottle. And then it just closed my of my breathing pipe and stuff like that. So they had to call the ambulance and I went to the hospital. That was my first attempt of trying to commit suicide. Fine, I came back, they forgave me, then tried to go back to school again. Then that time school was boring and, you know, didn't enjoy it anymore. Then started smoking weed from school, doing all those funny stuff. Yeah. Then at the age 15, I dropped out. I'm like, nah, I'm not going back to school anymore. So my uncle chased me out in the house. So at that moment, I met girls whereby they already, uh, they were already prostituting themselves. And it was like older girls, you know, my friends. So when we were there, they taught me, they're like, you know what, there's an uh, uh, easy way to survive. Leave your family. You can make it. We'll teach you how to, you know. So that's when I was introduced to uh, prostitution at the age of 15 years. What area is this? In Sri King. There's a, I don't know if I must call it by name, but there's a place that used to be called, before it used to be called Central Hotel, but now it's called Manhattan. So we went there and then they, they were working there. So what happened in there basically is that you own the room and then you just pay, let's say, 150 for a day. Then the rest of the money is yours. You can do whatever you want with it. So I said, I was like, cool, why not? It's money, you know, because making a lot of money, just paying 150 is nothing. So I just went and stayed there. Life was good at that moment. I felt like life was good. I was enjoying myself. No one is there telling me what to do. No one is controlling me. No one is abandoning me. Like I was just enjoying myself. But the things that I was drinking like almost every day, because honestly, it's not easy to sleep with different men or about 15 men a day sober. It, it's not okay. Like it's mm-hmm. 15 men a day. Sometimes it, it, sometimes it used to be more than that, more than 15 minutes a day. So at the age of 16, I fell pregnant. And then I tried to contact home because like I left home for about three years without talking to anyone. So I tried to call home, call my granny, because I knew her numbers by head and my uncles. So I called her, her phone was going on and I dropped the phone. I was scared to talk at that moment. And then she called back. And then suddenly I answered. I'm like, hey, it's me. Um, I'm not okay. I just want to come back home, stuff like that. She's like, where have you been? We've been looking for you. You just disappeared. You're not saying anything. I'm like, Ugh, it's a long story. I will tell when I reach home. They're like, come home. Come back home. Then I didn't go back to Paris. I went back to Val to Super Game where my granny stays now. So when I reached by my granny, I was three months pregnant, so I started working, uh, going to the clinic for antenatal and stuff like that. So from there, um, I stayed, you know, because I was like 16 years old. I stayed, and my green was like, my aunt was like, okay, when you're done giving birth, we'll take care of the child. You go back to school because you're still young. You can go back to school. I was like, cool, why not? But I don't know if I can say there was voices or a thing that was calling in the street. I didn't want to see myself sitting in the house. Like, mm-mm, I didn't want, you know. So when I was four months pregnant, I remember it was December time. So, you know, as in our culture, we have that thing that we do, like fire cracks and stuff like that. So, but before that, because we had a dog in our yard. So I had to close the dog, the, 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 you know, years in the, in the house of it and then do the fire cracks and stuff like that. And then, so I remember that time after 12, after doing the fire cricks and stuff like that, and I said to my green, I'm going to open for open the dog now to come out. My green was like, okay, cool. I jumped the fence. I ran after 12 midnight. So on the 1st of January of the new year. Of the new year of 2011. Your decision was, I'm running. Up. I'm just like, no, the street is calling, the boozing, alcohol. They took my phone. I, you know, I'm like, nah, I'm leaving. I'll see myself, but wherever I want to come, go away. And it was raining heavy that day. Eh? It was heavy. It was raining, and I decided to jump the fence. The last time my granny saw me is the time I said, I'm going to open the dog. That was the last time. I left. I arrived. There's a place called Chisanyama in Zone 14, because I was in Zone 13. Then in Zone 14, there's a place called Chisanyama. It's a club day and stuff like that. So when I arrived there, there was this guy outside in the test. Like, why are you standing here in the rain alone? And it's raining. 
be like, the guy's like, come in, let's go to my play. Let me give you something to change and let's go to drink. Mm-hmm. Like, cool, why not? We went, the guy borrowed me his track suit and then we went to the club, we drank, we drank. I went back, I slept with the guy. The volunteer he gave me money. And then I went to Frenaging, back to the same place where I was prostituting myself. When I arrived there, my room was still secure and some of my staff were still there. Are you not pregnant at this point? I'm still pregnant. Like, I'm four months pregnant. Yes, yes. Fine. It's January. Only twins, uh, yeah, Feb, on the 26th, I started having, like, pains in my tummy, but didn't understand what was going on. At that moment, people can't see that I'm pregnant because I was wearing things that are, you know. So, yes, and I was drinking a lot, you know. So on the 26th of Feb, 2011, I started feeling pains in my tummy, but they didn't understand what, what, what was going on at that moment. I continued sleeping around, drinking, you know, all that things. And then after that, on the 28th, I had a client that booked me for a whole night. So we're in the hotel. In the morning when I went, the pains were so severe that I couldn't walk. Like I didn't know what was going on, but I was in so much pain. The guy left, gave me the man. He left in the morning. I went to the bath. I bathed. I soaked myself in that water, but this pain didn't want to be easy. And I tried to walk. I think I was walking just like second, then I stopped. Second, and I stopped. And when I reached in the street, there was this guy passing. It's like, so what's going on? I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going on. It's like, okay, can we call ambulance? I'm like, please. They tried to call the ambulance, and we've waited, and have waited, and have waited. The ambulance didn't arrive at the moment. So next to that hotel where we was, there was a clinic just next day. So the guy took me to the medi clinic. And then when I got there, they demanded the such huge money. I'm like, no, nah, I don't have. But I have money on my back. I'm like, but I don't have such money. So I started bleeding. And then they gave me a purse to put in. And they're like, okay, let's call the ambulance. Then that time the ambulance arrived quickly. I went to hospital. When I arrived there, they examined me. They examined me. And then they said I had miscarriage. So they started injecting something in my trip and they're like, okay. And I waited for about three hours before this thing comes out and it was so much pains there. Mm-hmm. So while I was there waiting and after the, yeah, after the baby came out and stuff like there was a baby boy. So they asked me if I want to take a body or if someone is coming to fetch me and stuff like that. That moment I'm thinking I left home without them knowing where I am and stuff like that. And then, if I call them now, telling them, that, are they going to come? I'm like, I don't want to go home. Let me just do this myself. Let me handle it myself. At that time, they asked me how old I am. I said, I'm 18. By that time, I'm 16. Mm-hmm. So I signed a consent form that says they can bring the baby there. Slept there for three days. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. So this, yeah, they can bring them there. You sign the consent form. Or if you want to bury the baby, you take the baby. And then, yeah. So... After that, I stayed there for three days. They cleaned me and stuff like that, and I went back to the hotel. Continued doing, oh, the same doctor was helping me. Two weeks later, I met him in the same central hotel where we were prostituting. He recognized me. I didn't even recognize him. It's like, And then he started being my client. They became my regular. So, yeah. And then after that, yeah, I stayed, continued doing the same thing. And then I felt pregnant again with my second child. After how long? I th- just maybe a year. Okay. Yes. And then after that, um, so at this time it was a bit different because the guy that I dated, he was the he's the one that actually started. He was my client before we even like knowing who I was pregnant and stuff like that. He he was my client. They became my regular and then became my boyfriend. Then he made me stop doing prostitution. He was taking care of me, took me to his place, stuff like that. And then uh, mom, you, her mom realized that I was pregnant. I didn't know even I was pregnant. She asked me, like, how far are you? I was like, hmm? So, like, how far are you? I'm like, not pregnant. So the following day we did pregnancy test and I found out I was pregnant. Now you're 17. Now I'm 17. So I tried to call home. My granny started insulting me, telling me, hey, don't want to hear anything about you. Oh. Hey, every time when you come back here, you, you bring pregnancy. Stuff like, you know, all the things. And I was like, oh, okay, it's okay. Then I stayed there at a the boyfriend place. After a week, I think they called home. But the same was my aunt calling. She's like, hey, where are you? 
I'm like, I mean, Shakti, she's like, can you come uh, tomorrow morning home? I'm like, yeah, why not? Then I went home. Then we stayed. Then I told them, okay, yeah, the father of the child is there. I'm staying with him right now. Stuff like that. They're like, okay, you can come back home. So they wrote, because uh, Sipo was closer. So they wrote the letter that says the damage has been done, stuff like that. And they went back to my place. And then things did the way their culture is doing things. So fine, I stayed home. I stayed home. I was doing good. I was doing good. Whereby I gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. Um, after giving birth, I think when my daughter was a year, my aunt decided to let me go back to school. But I didn't go to, I didn't want to go to uniform school. I, was, I felt like I'm old now for that, you know. Yeah, you know, I'm like, uh-uh. I'm not going where to go. Because I dropped school at grade nine. Mm-hmm. And imagine, I'm, I have to go wear uniform at the age of... People who are 18 are doing matric already. So I have to... No, I'm like, nah. So they said, what do you want to do? I said, no, I can go to a bit school. So there's this old school they call, like, sure. yes. I went there. I was doing well, man. I was doing well. The father of my child was there. You know, everything was going smooth and nice. So um, when my daughter was nine months old, the dead disappeared. When the dead disappeared, I was shattered. Started drinking at school. Started lying, said I'm doing some project whereby we'll go around, drink, come back home late. I have to breastfeed. I, everything was just too much for me. So uh, I remember um, my aunt from, from Blomfontein was there. So she had a, a little boy who was about two years older than my, my daughter. So I lied to my aunt that day. I was like, no, man, we have project at school and I have to go this and this and this and this and this. We're writing about this. If I miss this out, you know, my aunt was like, you know what? I'll take the kids from to the mall. Just go and come back. Cool. I didn't come back. I went. I drank myself to death. I drank. I passed out wherever I was. And then after that, I woke up the following day and I'm like, it hit. Shit, I left the child. I have to go back home and stuff like that. Then I had that guard, you know. I went back. When I arrived there, my aunt, they were angry. They were, they were very angry. Sure. So my aunt decided that that time they're going to Bloemfontein. She's taking my granny with. I have to sort my things out. So they left me with the child alone. Say so this thing I'm running to. You know, now you see what's happening. Same thing that my mom was doing to me. Now it's following, going to me, because it's a bloodline case. Now I'm the one that abandoning my child, you know, not wanting to take responsibility, you know. So fine, I stayed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, I took the child to college, went to school, get drunk after school, went home, stole my, my granny's money, didn't fetch the child from crash, went back to Central Hotel. Hey family, thank you so much for being loyal to Engineering Your Life. I know that if you're watching this, you're probably here for the second time or the third time. And please, if you're here for the second, third time, please may you kindly subscribe. Because if you subscribe, it helps us to get better conversation, get better guests, and get access to creating the best content that we can for you. So please don't forget to subscribe and make sure you continue watching this episode. Started meeting other Nigerians who was, because this guy was very old, so I never used to sleep with him. I, like, I never slept with him. He, I think I was about 20, 21, something. Yes. So after that then, this guy was old. His name, they used to call him Baba Nugu. So he was so old, so I, I didn't have interest to sleep with him. I, I didn't want to. So me and him, it was business, just like that. He buys me food, clothes, hair. I make money. He gives me drugs. That's all, you know. So I met these other small Nigerians that were charming and, you know, just because now I'm so used to that thing. Now I'm jumping to other Nigerians to the next one, you know. I stayed with this one. His name was Casey. He started beating me. I went back to Uja again. And then I met this other one. They call him Escape. So I stayed with Escape, not knowing that now I was taking myself to a pit of hell. Because Escape was so abusive. When I mean abusive, I mean emotionally, physically, mentally. That guy was so abusive. I've got scars on my body. That God's story of everything that the guy did to me. You know, 
So I stayed with this guy. When I stayed with him, um, I couldn't let, like I couldn't leave him anymore. I don't know why. I couldn't leave. At that moment, I didn't understand why because I was that kind of person that when you start beating me, I leave. I don't want someone to touch me, so I leave. But this one, it was so difficult. It was so, not knowing the guy was using juju on me, which is the call muti, you know? So I stayed with the guy almost five to six years. I was with this guy, whereby he would hit me, abuse me, but I would still be there, you know? And it came to a point where he brainwashed me so much that he will like he will beat me and he will come and say, You see what you make me to do. You understand? So it came to the point where like I started believing oh, I'm the one provoking him to beat me. I mean though it was not like that. You understand? This guy stepped me, this guy bent me, this guy killed my child, whereby he took me to do a potion without me knowing because I was so high on drugs. He said that it's taking me to the doctor to, to check up. Not knowing how Oh, so sad. Don't, don't take your time. Not knowing that he was taking me to go do abortion. So I remember this day, it was 2014 or 15. So we, I think it was 2014 or 15. So I was with a smoking client whereby we smoked for a week. I haven't slept for a week. Mm. So this guy decided to leave Monday morning. So when this guy left Monday morning, um, I was about to take a bath and like, okay, finish the bath. And I'm like, okay, you know what? Let me smoke weed and rest because weed, I could like calm down a bit from drugs. So he's like, no, don't smoke weed now. Take these stones. He gave me about six stones to smoke of drugs. It's like, no, I just want to take you to the doctor quickly for checkup, you know, because he knows that he made me pregnant. You understand? I was about four months pregnant at that time. So he took me to the um, abortion clinic. That time, you know, when you are high and stuff, it, just things you don't just put in mind. You just go with the flow. We arrived there. She, he was busy talking to these girls alone on the side, not knowing what's going on. So we arrived there. They did sauna, and then he paid the money. And then remember, take, they take, they took me to this room. They gave me two tablets. I said I must put it under my tongue. Then I must wait there. So I sat there. But then now the drugs start coming out on my system. Now my mind is like it's coming back, you know. Then there was this lady sitting next to me. I'm like, what's happening here? You know, where's the doctor? Like I've been sitting here waiting for this doctor. This lady is like, nah, this is abortion clinic. At that time it was late already because. The tablets is killing the baby inside, mm. you know. So I sat there and I was like, what? Like I became cold. My whole body froze. I became so cold. Yeah. Instead of crying, I couldn't cry. It was so difficult. I sat there and I started feeling pains. They took me to this other room where like there's a stretch bed. You just sit there, open your legs. They tie your legs there. And then there's this sharp mental thing like screwdriver that's like mm. you know going down on your vagina go straight to the womb and then that thing when it comes because there's a screen that is there next to you that you can see when that mental enter your womb like open up like and it's like things like razors where it cuts the baby chops the baby like a means chops the baby chops the baby and then after that when that thing is done it closes again and it comes out when it comes out then those pieces of a child and stuff already come out mm. so I experienced but okay thank God he's with Jesus now so after that he came and fetched me back and then we went back to the place he fed me drugs he fed me drugs he, I became numb I became numb to the point that I've never cried it took me a year and six months before I cried mm. I became numb to the point where I built this world that I will never cry again in my life that was like how numb I was. After that, I stayed in the house, I think, for a week to recover and stuff like that. Started smoking drugs. I lost a lot of weight because of stress now and not eating and all the like. I became so thin. This time I was so bad, you know. Um, after that, uh, I continued. I gained 
started gaining weight again, continued living there doing the same thing again, and then he would beat me. I've got a scar on my back where he stabbed me with a full glass. I didn't cry. He bent me here on my hand with hot water and dead hole, whereby he tied me with a, a belt. You know, the stretchy belt. Yes. So he tied me with that belt and then he poured hot water and poured dead hole. So when he removed that belt, it came out with my skin. This was very bad. So this side, I don't know where it went, just disappeared. And then he almost took my eye out. I've got a sky here where he bit me with the, the what you call? This, the belt thing on my eye. Um, he raped me where he tried to rape me on my anal. He even put a screwdriver on my anal trying to, I don't know what he was doing, but mm. yes. Um, yeah, he did so many things whereby he would sit, like, so he used to have this thing also when he's beating you, he will take chili. There's this orange chili that Nigerians, they love. He will crush that chili and he closes, he cl he closes your eyes with it. Like he wrapped it on your ass and then he wrapped it on your vagina. I don't know, that was his kind of way punishing you or something. And then he make you go and bath with cold water. So imagine the pain that is there. So this one time when he closes this eye, he wrapped the chill as well. So he thought that I couldn't see what he was doing. So I saw him with this small bottle with red ribbons whereby, because I was bleeding, he took my blood with that mm. um, small bottles that he was using. So... I left, or oh, I remember that the fight became too much, me and him. So I left him. I went to stay with other Nigerian. So when I went and stayed with another Nigerian, he started disturbing me on the street. It's like, I'm not going to stay with any Nigerian while he's still here in Pretoria. But I'm like to him, you're not the one who brought me in Pretoria. So you're not going to tell me what to do with my life. This is my life. Whoever I want to stay with, I will choose who I'm going to stay with. You're not going to tell me what to do. It's like, okay, try it. Try to bump me with the car in the street. Every time when he saw me with the client, he disturbs me. And stuff like that. And then he took me. He said, okay, you know what? Go to rehab. Go and rest. You will come back. So I went to the rehab. Um, that was my first time trying to go to rehab. Changed my life. So there was this lady. There's this lady they call Mama V. Vilna Badi. So she, she's a pastor. She helps the girls in the street. So she used to walk before. Oh, wait, wait. I'm too forward. Before that. So Mama V met me in the street while I left escape. I was with this other Nigerian guy. So when Mama B left me in the street, she like, when she met me in the street, she's like, I want to talk to you. I want to help you. Yeah. And then I will insult her in that moment. You know, this white people coming and disturbing me, you know. Mm -hmm. Then I will insult her telling her that, who said I want help? I don't want help. I'm okay and stuff like that. She's like, no, Jesus wants me to help you. Mm -hmm. And I will be saying to her, no, tell Jesus me I don't want help. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Who is Jesus? I don't know that person, mm -hmm. you know. And then after that, she will, like she she never gave up. She still she still came and came, so she will like give us makeup, things to bath. At winter, they bring such like uh, soup, polar yeah. fleas, yeah. yeah, some scarves and soup and stuff like that. You know, she used to take care of the girls at the street. So I remember there was this girl I was staying with her in that place. She was sick, so I said to her, so I saw her on the street, and I'm like, okay, you said you want someone to help. I don't want help but there's someone you can help. Mm. She's like, okay, who's that? I'm like, I've got a friend in the house that is sick, so you can help her. So they came in, they took Mpo. Her name was Mpo. They took her. Mama V wasn't staying far from where the girls was working in that territory. She was staying, I think, just, let's say, two, two minutes walk from where we were, you know? She had a house there in Beckett Street. So she took Mpo. They left. Fine. A week passed. And then I had a fight with this Nigerian guy. And at this time, I became so evil as well. So I started showing the cops where they put in the drugs. So not me knowing how dangerous they are. After doing that, then I decided to go to Mama V by myself. So I went there, I walked, go went there, and then she opened for me. And then I stayed there, I think, for a week or two weeks. So then when this thing was calling, excuse me, this drugs or whatever voice I was hearing, it was calling. Then I went back to the street again. 